if you don't subscribe to the weekly emails for groups, uh, you should, even if you're not in a group, because Laura is an outstanding teacher and you'd, in, you'd, you'd enjoy, she follows up the sermon each week with some information, and so I think you'd enjoy that. If you, if you don't, you can subscribe, and I would encourage you to do so. Let's bow once more as we come to God's Word. Father God, we live in a broken world and we are ourselves broken people. And it seems every day that we are reminded of that as we turn on the news. And we just want to remember our Jewish brothers and sisters in Pittsburgh and the incredible grief they're experiencing. And that's just one example of horrible things that happen all over the world every day. And yet we say that you love and that you love us and that you're sovereign. Sometimes it's hard to reconcile that, God, but we believe it, we cling to it this morning. We ask you to remind us as we come to your word just who you are and who we are because of you. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for your word, and we ask you to speak to us through it. We pray in your name. Amen. Well, if you were here last week, you know that we uh, had kind of a boring topic that nobody cares much about, Jesus in politics. I got a few emails from some of you. Thank you for that. Appreciate that, you know. Um, but we're talking about, in the context of being with Jesus as, our, as our, our theme for the fall, what that means, if you're new, if you haven't been with us, is this. When Jesus calls the disciples to follow him, and they do, it's not a nine-to-five thing or a part-time thing or, you know, come with me for a while and go back home. It's to live your life with him all the time. And it isn't different for us today, even though he's not walking the earth in the flesh anymore. He calls us to live with him. Well, what does it mean to live with Jesus? And we've been walking through what that means, and we're in a part of that series called Wrestling with Jesus, because if you're going to live with him, you have to take seriously the things that he said, and he said some things and taught some things that aren't always easy to reconcile or understand in our culture. So if last week wasn't contentious enough, we'll talk about Jesus and money this morning. How about that? Some of you are like, oh, no, I haven't been back in months, and I came on the money Sunday. Well, you know, or if you're new, right? <laughs> Actually, do you know that Jesus talked more about money in the New Testament, in the Gospels, than he talked about heaven? He talked about more about money and possessions than hell. He talked about more about money than he talked about prayer. Apparently, it was important to him that we hear what he has to say. If I preached on money as often as Jesus talked about it, none of you would come back ever. <laughs> Jesus and money. Let's begin with uh, asking this question. What is money? It sounds like a weird question, but I think we should ask that. What is money? I've got some money, real money, not Monopoly money. I've got some of the kind that folds, and I've got a little few, little kind that, you know, jingles. What, is this money? Yes or no? Ah, uh, are you sure? I mean, this, this is a $20 bill, and these are quarters. Anyway. Is this money, and what makes, the, what, why is this piece of paper and these pieces of metal, why do we decide these are valuable? What gives them value? People say so. In fact, uh, interestingly enough, I saw this, uh, or watched, listen, listen to this, excuse me, episode on NPR called This American Life. There was an episode from 2012 or 13, I forgot the year, but it's called The Invention of Money. If you ever listen to this, you should go look this up, it's fantastic. It's kind of shocking. And they're asking the question, remember in 2008 and 9 when the market crashed, of course you all remember that, but in December of 2008 when this is happening, we would hear on the news every day that so many trillion dollars were disappeared from the U.S. economy, right? Remember that? Every day. And then like in the course of three days, like $20 trillion was gone. Do you ever stop to think about, what do you mean 20 trillion? 20 trillion of these are gone? Did you ever think, where did they go? Like, how can they just be gone? Where did $20 trillion go? Was there a huge fire in the giant money barn our government has? Like, did it burn up? Was it, is there a ship at sea with all the money in it that like sank? Where is the, where did it go? Is there a black hole that sucked it up? Where did $20 trillion go? You know what the answer is? It really was never there to begin with. Not the way you're thinking of it. It was never actually there. World-renowned economist Gary Becker talks about fiction, the fictional quality of money. He wrote an essay called The Fictional Quality of Currency. It says, all you need for money to be real is for enough people to believe in it. That's all that this is, is that enough of us say, I trust it. I believe in it. There's value here. 
Even if you go back to the gold standard, why do we decide gold is valuable? We just decide. I believe in that. In fact, in this episode on, on, the, um, on, that, on that podcast, there was a, a discussion of the island of Yap. Anybody ever heard of the island of Yap in Micronesia? A couple of you know about this? Some of you don't? This is fascinating. A small island in, in Micronesia called Yap. On this island, archaeologists and anthropologists have discovered that ancient form of currency they use for huge purchases. Not everyday stuff, but like a, a bride price or buying land or bl- buying animals, flocks and herds, that kind of thing, or buying a home. And you know what they are? You'll see an image here. There are these giant limestone disks. This is currency in this ancient civilization on the island of Yap for massive purchases. They're huge. They're ones even bigger than this. And you can't move them very well. And sometimes they wouldn't move them. They would just say, this stone is now Bob's stone. It was my stone, but I'm giving it to Bob because I'm buying Bob's daughter or whatever. I don't know. And so Bob gets the stone. We're not moving it. It just stays here, but Bob has it now. And they, this is how they did this. In fact, they, they, they got these discs by uh, quarrying the limestone on a different island. And they would bring them back to Yap on these massive catamaran boats. And there's a story about one time a storm came up and two of the biggest ones that ever, that ever quarried fell off the boat into the sea and sank to the bottom. And they said, well, that's okay. They're still there. That's still good currency. Uh, we still counts. Now they're yours, even though they're at the bottom. They're yours down there. You know? This sounds crazy. Doesn't it? it sounds ridiculous and funny, doesn't it? If you think about it, it really isn't a whole lot different than what we do. What is Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, or this piece of paper, or this piece of metal, but a group of people deciding this has value? And if people believe in it, it becomes real. That's why economies and nations crash, because people stop believing in it. Keep that in mind now. Enough people believe in it, and money becomes real. As we go to look at what Jesus has to say about our lives as his followers and money. If you have your Bible open to Luke chapter 12. Again, there's lots of passages we could choose from, but we're going to look at one little story Jesus told in a remarkable context. Luke 12, verses 13 through 21. Someone in the crowd said to him, Teacher, tell my brother to divide the inheritance with me. But he said to him, Man, who made me a judge or arbitrator over you? And he said to them, Take care. Be on your guard against all covetousness. For one's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. And he told them a parable, saying, The land of a rich man produced plentifully. And he thought to himself, What shall I do? For I have nowhere to store my crops. And he said, I'll do this. I will tear down my barns and build larger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, Fool! This night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? So is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. This is a passage, a parable about riches, about wealth, treasure, and money. And there's a lot going on in here, as there always is in Jesus' stories. In his accounts. The context for the parable, if you read back earlier in Luke 12 and in Luke 11, Jesus is in this long teaching on heaven, hell, and judgment. Weighty things. He's in the middle of teaching about heaven and hell and the reality of God's coming judgment. And in the middle of his teaching, this guy pipes up and goes, I have a question. What about my brother? Tell him to share the inheritance with me. If I were Jesus, I would have been like, hey man, you're not paying attention? What am I talking about here? In fact, it reminds me of a story one time when I was, uh, I was at a camp counselor for fifth grade and sixth grade boys. And I was, it was the night on the camp, the summer camp, when I was going to share the gospel, this plan of salvation with them. And I had them all quiet. I told them a story about God's love, and I was sharing the gospel, and they were all looking at me with, you know, intent eyes. And I said, boys, have any questions? And one kid goes, I do. I said, yeah. He goes, my brother was riding a skateboard in my neighbor's yard, and it went up in the garage, and it broke some stuff. I was like, any other questions? <laughs> you know, it's like... It's like, what is this guy talking about? Heaven, hell, the coming judgment. Ah, my brother won't share the inheritance with me. And Jesus, rather than shutting him up and getting back on subject, he uses this as an opportunity to teach all of us, this man, the crowds, and us, about something he thinks is so important for us to hear. First thing is the warning. He gives us a warning. I I think you need to hear that this morning. Jesus is warning you. He's warning me. He's warning us. And I don't know of a culture in history that has more needed this warning than ours. 
about the danger of money. This guy thinks his problem is his greedy brother, but Jesus is trying to say there's something more going on here. Listen to verse 15 again. Take care, he said, be on your guard against all covetousness, for your life, one's life, does not consist in the abundance of possessions. Take care, watch out, be on your guard. Years ago, a man called and asked if I would get involved in helping him settle a dispute with one of his good friends in the business uh, arrangement with, involving a lot of money. After talking with him on the phone, I knew two things immediately. Number one, I should not get involved in this. Number two, even though I think this man who I knew very well was, was justified and right, he was way too attached to the money. And I told him so, and he didn't like that very much. My brother-in-law told me a very tragic story in his own family. His parents were getting on in years, and they had arranged, they, his family's wealthy, and they had a lot of money in Southern California. They had arranged all their, their, their funds and finances and trusts, and that was all set. But it was all their stuff, you know, all the stuff you accumulate through life, homes and cars and tables and chairs. And they made an itemized list, list of all their stuff, down to every little fork, everything. And they had their three kids, two sons and a daughter, uh, sit down and, and sort of divvy it up, make a list of the things that they wanted, and go through a whole process of figuring out who gets what. So it was kind of awkward. We did this years ago. So my sister at that time was in her early 20s, and she was kind of a pseudo-socialist, and she said, I don't need stuff, and she didn't pick much. And then later, more recently, she came back and said, I was an idiot when I was young. Can we redo that, brothers? <laughs> and Mark, my brother said, yeah, let's do that. His other brother said, I don't think so. Had a big fight about it. Finally, the father had him sit down and go through the, everybody, their other brother, sibling's list and pick things that they would want and willing to give up. Think about that. His mother had passed away. His father was near the end of his life. They did this again to re redistribute the stuff and the things. And my brother-in-law says his brother would not budge on the stuff that he wanted and wanted to give up. And it became this huge fight. And it got him so angry, my brother-in-law, that he finally said, you know what? I don't want any of this. I'm signing all of my list, all of my third over to my sister. She gets my third. And his brother thought, wait a minute, she gets two-thirds and I get one-third. He got so angry. It caused this big fight. And they, haven't, they didn't speak to each other for over a year over stuff on a list. This guy comes to Jesus, and he's hearing Jesus talk about eternity, and he says, yeah, but tell my brother, help my brother, help me settle this inheritance dispute. You know, greed is the one sin nobody thinks they have. I've been a pastor for a long time. People have come and confessed all kinds of things to me. Pride, anger, unforgiveness, lust, sexual sin. No one's ever come into my office and said, Pastor, I'm, I think I'm just so greedy. It's never happened. Now, I've had people say, I think my brother-in-law's greedy. I think that person's greedy. Look at the way they live. Nobody comes and says, it's me, right? Why? Because it's, it's got this deceptive quality to it. You're always looking to compare yourself to somebody else who has more. You never think it's you. This is why Jesus says, watch out, take care. You don't see it. Like, you know if you're telling a lie. I mean, I suppose you could lie enough that you convince yourself of a lie, but most people know if they're telling a lie, right? You know if you're cheating. You know if you're committing adultery. You don't accidentally go, oh, this is not my wife. I didn't know this. Like, you, you know. I shouldn't joke about that, but you get what I'm saying, right? It's terrible stuff, but you know in your heart that you're doing something wrong. But how do you know if you're greedy? How do you know if you're being greedy? What's the line? It sneaks up on us. This is why Jesus says, watch out, take care. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, the apostle Paul says, but those who desire to be rich fall into temptation, into a snare, into many senseless and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is the root of all kinds of evils. It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many pangs. This is what Jesus meant when he talked about the deceitfulness of riches in Mark chapter 4. You see, money lies to you. It lies to you. The lie it tells this man in the, who asked Jesus the question is this. If you don't get your share, you miss out on what your life could be. If you don't get yours, you're losing out on life. You have to have it. All day long in our culture, money is whispering to you and sometimes shouting to you. I'm your life. I am your life. You have to have me. You need me. That's why Jesus says, watch out. Be on your guard. This is, brings us to the trap. 
The purpose of the parable Jesus tells here about this rich fool is to show the reality of the problem, to give us a picture of what's happening to us. Now, let me be clear about something. Jesus is not saying in this parable, nor does the Bible ever teach, that it's wrong to be a prosperous business owner. The man's farm and and crops and lands and his business is producing more. That's not a bad thing. If you own a business or work for a business and you turn that business from a $200,000 business into a $2 million business, you've done a good thing. If your investments grow, that's not bad. If you get a promotion or a raise, that is not bad. God is not displeased. Nowhere does the Bible teach that. That's not the problem in the passage. The problem is in verses 19 and 20. We get a little hint into this man's heart. In verse 19, he says, And I will say to my soul, Soul, you have ample goods laid up for many years. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. But God said to him, fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and the things you have prepared, whose will they be? The real issue is what the man says to his soul. I love the way Jesus puts this. I will say to my soul. You ever talk to your soul? You ever do that? You ever go, soul? You're thinking, I don't do that. Yes, you do. We all do it all the time. You don't say it that way, but you are talking to your soul all the time. And most of the time, we're telling ourselves and listening to the wrong messages. What are you saying to your soul? Soul, if I had fill in the blank, I would feel, I would, we would be secure. Soul, I I don't need to be a millionaire, but if I could just get this paid for, or just get this blank, fill in the blank, then I'd be secure, then I'd, become, then I'd be okay, then this would be right in my life, then I'd feel better about myself and our future. We all talk to our soul. What did the man in the parable say? Soul, you've got ample goods stored up. You've made it. All your labor and striving to build this business and climb the ladder and scratch and claw, you got there. Now all you have to do is protect it. Build bigger barns to keep it safe, and you're set. Relax, eat, drink, be merry. This is the first century version of the American dream. Work hard. Be successful. So that someday you can retire, relax, and just enjoy life. What does that imply? Life is terrible until you make it. Can't enjoy it just hard work and scratching and clawing and protecting it, fretting about the economy, worrying about who's in office, wringing your hands all the time about your 401k, trying to climb the ladder in business, worried about who's getting what until you finally get there. Now I got there. Relax. And if Jesus is not the risen Lord, you know, the truth is, if Jesus is not the risen Lord, if, if you're just worm food when you die, really, I mean, really, if, you're, if your life is the random collocation of atoms, the process of natural selection and chance, then, then this is a perfectly appropriate way to live. Eat, drink, be merry. For tomorrow you die and you don't exist. So, so get all the pleasure and joy for you and for yours that you can, because what does it matter anyway? The Apostle Paul says this actually very thing in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 32. He says, what do I gain, humanly speaking, if I fought with beasts at Ephesus? This is reference to something earlier in the text. He says, if the dead are not raised, let us eat, drink, for tomorrow we die. If the dead are not raised, if Christ is not raised, if he's not the Son of God who's forgiven your sin and has claim over your life and, and you belong to him, if none of that's true, then, then you shouldn't you walk out. It doesn't matter. Chase what you think is going to give you fulfillment. And so many people are doing just that, aren't they? So many are doing exactly that. Giving an intellectual nod to God, maybe they believe in him culturally, but... They're chasing what they view as the good life. In fact, the use this man planned to make of his wealth revealed where his treasure in his heart truly was. The resurrection shows us this life is not the only life you get. This treasure is not the only treasure you get in life. There's so much more coming. In fact, this doesn't even, it isn't even that valuable. You can have it. 
Oh, it didn't make it. Actually, I'll need that back for next service. <laughs> it doesn't really matter. It's not real. <laughs> There's so much more God has for us. Let me give you this little chart here on the screen. I adapted this from a blog I read a, a few months ago from Sky Jatani, a writer and thinker I respect, and added a couple of things, but it, it's helpful. If you look at the idol of money and the living God, right? Make me feel secure? They both do that. Feel is the operative word. Offer me power and control, or at least the illusion of it. They both do that. Give me a sense of value and dignity in my life? They both do that. There's a community that shares my worship. That's absolutely true in our culture, isn't it? There's a huge community worshiping money. Will never abandon me even after death. Well, now it changes. Gives me true peace and eternal security. So what Jesus says, watch out, be on your guard. You don't see it because you're swimming also in the same fishbowl, but it's so dangerous. The rich man in the parable thought he was being prudent and wise, making plans for his future. But God called him a fool. That, you should pause there for a minute. The, in the parable, the rich man was doing what our culture would applaud. He's taking care of his investment. He's protecting his growing wealth. He's ensuring its, you know, its security and its ability to serve his needs in the future. What's wrong with that? He's saving, he's investing, he's taking care of what he's earned. That's responsible, that's prudent, that's wise. And God says, fool. You're a fool. Why? Because of what's going on in this man's heart. This is his security. This is his comfort. This is his identity. I'm going to read to you from Luke uh, 12. It won't be on the screen, but it's at the end of this little passage. Jesus, after this parable of, of the lost, the, the rich fool, talks about worry and anxiety, which is not accidental. And then he says this in verses 32 to 34. You can open your Bible, but it won't be on the screen. He says, fear not, little flock, for it is your father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. Sell your possessions and give to the needy. Provide yourselves with money bags that don't grow old and treasure in heavens that does not fail, where no thief approaches and no moth destroys. For where your treasure is, there your heart is also. I love how he starts, fear not, little flock. I love that. Why? Because we do, don't we? We are fearful. We do have anxiety. We do worry about the security that we think money brings. Fear not, little flock. It's your Father's pleasure to give you the kingdom. Now, notice the order there. What if it was reversed? What if God said, sell your possessions, give to the poor, and then your Father will give you the kingdom and you don't have to fear? doesn't say that, does he? He says, don't be afraid. God's already given you the kingdom of infinite worth and value. You are a son or a daughter of the king. All that is his is yours now and for eternity. So don't be afraid. And that frees you then to sell your possessions, give to the poor, and be radically generous. This is not a pastoral plea for money. We already took the offering. This is, this is I'm trying to tell you what Jesus is saying to our, to our hearts, to our souls. Fear not. Your Father has given you more than you can imagine. So don't cling tightly to this stuff that people believe in. This brings us to the cure. Jesus is warning us not to fall into the trap of money, the trap of chasing the good life with your wealth. But what's the solution or the cure? Well, actually, in verse 21, the last verse of this little section, he says, so is the one who lays up treasure for himself and is not rich toward God. That little phrase, rich toward God, is fascinating. It's the only time in all the New Testament we read that phrase. We often read about the riches of God or being rich in God or in Christ, but the only time we read this phrase, be rich toward God, is here. What does that mean, rich toward God? Well, you might think, well, it means, you know, give toward God, give, give to God. But we're told in the Scriptures, God owns the cattle on a thousand hills. He says, if I were hungry, I would not tell you. Does he need your money? You know, God's doing Okay. He's not like, oh, if they would only give me more. Because he needs it. That's not what it means to be rich toward God. 
It's not to enrich God. He already owns it all, including what you think is yours. What does this phrase mean then, to be rich toward God? I, I've been thinking about this. I think the best way to say it is this. Being rich toward God means to count God as your riches. To count God as your riches. There's a verse in Psalms 37, 4 that says, Delight yourself in the Lord, and he will give you the desires of your heart. Have you heard that verse before? What does that mean? You know, for years I thought it meant this. I have desires of my heart, and if I delight myself in the Lord, whatever that is, he will give me those desires. Like he's the genie in the bottle, right? If I delight myself in the Lord, like rubbing the lamp, then he gives me my desires. I don't think that's what it means. And then I thought, well, I have desires of my heart, and some are good, God-honoring, and some are not so good. And God, if I delight in him, he sorts that out and gives me the good desires and takes away the bad desires. I think that's better, but it's not what it means. I think what the psalmist is saying to us there is, delight yourself in the Lord, and that is becomes the desire of your heart, delighting in him. He becomes your greatest treasure and riches. And that's what he gives you, more and more of himself. Sometimes I think you think pastors are immune to this temptation. The fear not little flock part. I should be the most generous person. And my, we're growing in that area. You know, for years though, the lie the evil one told me, the lie of money, you know, money lies to you, I told you that, right? You know the lie that the money was telling me? This is a little bit weird to confess to you, but here it goes. I'm provided for by, the, by God's grace and your generosity. That's what provides for my family. So I sort of was convinced in my head of the lie that, well, you know, it's kind of like giving back to myself. Think of how ridiculous that is. We should be the most generous. I don't know what the lie money tells you, but we all struggle. Now that, God's got me past that, and we're, we're being, we're, we're, we're doing our giving, our tithing online, on, on recurring on the app, and we give, it's more fun for us to give to other things that, as they come up, but it's taken a while. It's got, my heart gets entangled, I guess, you, you know, for years, I've got three brother-in-laws. One is a surgeon, a vascular surgeon at Northwestern Memorial Hospital in the city. One is a, a senior research partner, uh, v- vice president of Nuveen Investment Company, and one is a, a senior partner at a massive law firm in the city. And they all live in Wheaton. And they all have, and my kids have worn their hand-me-downs for you. I told one of my brother-in-laws, your life makes my life possible. I appreciate that. <laughs> you know? And they all have investments, right? We would get together when my kids were young, with all families, the kids would play, and my brother-in-law would sit at the table and talk about the economy and investments in the stock market. I don't know what the heck they're talking about. I know sports trivia, C.S. Lewis quotes, and theology. <laughs> so I'm like, uh, I don't have any investments, so I go play Legos with the kids, you know? <laughs> Seriously. And I always felt bad about myself. I always felt like, uh, you know, I'm, I'm less than when I'm around them, because I had more. That's the lie money tells you. Those guys all love the Lord and they're generous to us. Why, why don't I celebrate God's grace in their lives and thankful for the provision in my life instead of feeling somehow inferior? Maybe you can relate to that. That's why Jesus says, fear not. I mean, don't, don't be on your guard. Watch out. So to be rich toward God means to count God as your riches. How do you do that? First Timothy Chapter 6, verses 18 and 19, the Apostle Paul says, They, meaning us, are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so they may take hold of that which is truly life. If you like to underline or highlight, you should underline that phrase. So we, we, we give away this stuff, right? Temporal wealth that God gives us. Why? Not irresponsibly, but generously. And, all, and by the way, generosity means what? We often think, like, if somebody gives you $100, you think, how generous. It was to you, but was it to them? Generosity is not in the receiver. It's in the giver. Am I being generous? Am I taking what God has given me and giving to the point where it causes me to trust him, where it puts sort of tangible reality is that he's my riches and not this stuff? That's what it means. 
So the Paul says, be rich in, 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 in good deeds and be generous with your wealth. Why? So that you can take hold of that which is truly life. He's saying something very profound, which we have to hear. He's saying, if you're holding on to money, you can't grab on to that which is truly life. So giving is not because God needs your money. It's to release your grip so you can grab on to life. What's life? John 17, 3, Jesus says it. This is eternal life, that you believe in the only true God and in Jesus Christ whom you have sent. This is your life. This is your life to know God. And you really can't know him if you're holding on to this. So we give, why? To make a difference in the world, yes. To make an impact, yes. To see God bless it, multiply it, of course. But fundamentally, because I gotta let go. I gotta let go so that I can grab onto life. The only source of life, true life. That's why Jesus says to this man, you fool. You're holding onto the wrong stuff and your life is required of you, your soul is required of you. I'm gonna just walk you through a series of four questions that just to do your own little heart diagnostic and then we'll, we'll worship and close. I just want you to quiet your mind and heart. I want you to hear me ask these questions and maybe as if God's asking you this. And just do your own little inventory, not to make you feel guilty or bad because Jesus is really saying to you, fear not, little flock. Your father is giving you the kingdom. Let go of this stuff. What is money, right? But something that enough people believe in to make it real. You, you, know, you know your money's backed up by the national government, right? The FDIC guarantees, insures your money. But our government is $21 trillion in debt and growing, and you don't know who's going to be at the helm in a couple years. Jesus is on the throne yesterday, today, and forever, and he owns all that exists, including you and your stuff, and he's never once failed to fulfill a promise. Which is the surer thing? Right? Which is the better bet? That's all Jesus is saying to us. Let me ask you these questions. Number one, do I ever compromise my character integrity even a little bit in the pursuit of financial gain? You ever cut a corner, shade the truth? Number two, how do I respond when I lose my possessions or when my money is threatened? How do you respond when you feel your stuff feels threatened? You freak out? Number three, is my first thought when I get a raise or more money of any kind to think about what I could do for myself or to think about how I could bless others and honor God? That one was convicting for me. And number four, do your thoughts, your daydreams, do they run after things, stuff, and wealth? Or do they run after God? When your mind wanders, does it wander to the goodness of God, his love for you in Christ, and the difference he wants you to make in the world? Or does it run after what you could have, what you could get? Jesus says to me, to my heart and to ours, fear not, little flock. It is your Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. So be rich in him. Be rich toward God. Make him your treasure. Let's pray. Father God, all of us are entangled in this, whether we have a lot of money or whether we struggle to make ends meet. This is a temptation for all of us. Nobody's immune. And you know our hearts. And you know where we struggle. And Lord, I thank you that you do speak to us as a little flock of wayward sheep. You love us. You warn us because you love us, not to condemn, not to judge, but to set us free. So for each of us, God, I pray by your spirit and your grace, you would enable us to let go of the things we're holding on to in this life so we may take hold of you who are truly life. We pray in your name. Amen.